It's always a blessing, a lot of great memories. And um, well, um, we're going to continue our study in the book of Acts. This actually should be um, almost, to me, it felt like a, a refresher of sorts because we recently had a message about the qualifications of a deacon and, and a pastor. We kind of kind of lumped both of those in there together. But we actually spent some time in Acts chapter 6 when we were talking about the qualifications of a deacon. So a little bit of this seems like just a little bit of a refresher, but we're going through the book of Acts chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And we're just going to keep trucking right along. Here we are on Acts chapter 6. If you remember, and it doesn't have to have much of an introduction, last week we went through Acts chapter 5 and we had Ananias and Sapphira and um, they sold a piece of land and they gave, laid it, the money at the apostles' feet. But the problem was they, didn't, they weren't honest about how much they gave and, um, and God dealt harshly with that. Um, a lot of times there's kind of, you know, in the Bible there's the law first mentioned, but sometimes God sets precedent. Um, in certain situations, and he just wanted to kind of say, "Hey, look, you know, it's one thing. Um, it, it's a whole other on a whole other level to, hide, to lie to God." As Peter said, "You not just lied to man, but more importantly, you've lied to God." And um, and then, if you remember, we finished up chapter five, and um, if I remember right here, because I'm losing my mind, because I had this in my head before I um, got here tonight. Um, oh, I know what it was. Basically, if you look at the last couple of verses there, um, remember there was Gamaliel, that great teacher of the law, and he gave the Jews some great counsel and advice. He said, look, if these men who are preaching in the name of Jesus Christ, if they're not of God, it'll just come to nothing. It'll fizzle out. But if they are of God, there's nothing you can do to stop it. And hey, that ought to be encouraging to us. If what we're doing is what God has called us to do, and we're preaching the unfeigned gospel of Christ, you know, it's a pure gospel, guess what? The world can't stop it. And um, I'm thankful for that assurance. So let's jump right into Acts chapter 6. After just, I'll pray just real briefly, and we'll get right into it. And we'll read the entire chapter like what's been customary to do the last little bit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. Lord, we thank you for your word and ask you to please bless as we study your word tonight that we can... Find something in here, Lord, and I, I know that if we if we look, we'll find it. Something that can be a blessing and a help to us, an encouragement. Uh, maybe it'll challenge our hearts, Lord, to live more for you. Um, thank you for your word and how precious it is. Lord, help it to be more precious to us every day. Lord, help us as we um, go through this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Acts chapter 6. We're going to read all the verses. That's what happens when you have a daughter. I've got like glitter on my hand. Um, Acts chapter 6. Verse 1, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the, Grecian against, uh, the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Sicily, Cilicia, and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned suborn men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. 
For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. So, I know we have a um, finance committee meeting, and so I really wanted to get off into chapter 7 tonight, too, because I love the story of Stephen, but we're going to have to save that rest of the story for, t for next week. But let's, as we jump right into Acts chapter 7 this evening, you know, if you want a review of that, and I, you're going to find this interesting, I feel like I'm an advertiser. If you would like a review of last week, you can find the message on Acts chapter 5 on the church's YouTube channel. Um, yes, this is a plug for our YouTube channel. Um, for you that are out there in the audience or if you're watching via live stream, as we live stream services to YouTube, we, we are actually building out a repository of all the videos that we've done thus far, and they're all right there on the church's YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube and you search Stanford Baptist Church, you will certainly find it. And, um, and you'll find the channel page. And guess what? If you go a step further, if you want to, totally op optional. But if you create a YouTube account, you can get notifications when we go live and anytime new videos are uploaded. You can even thumbs up or, heaven forbid, thumbs down a video. <laughs> and you can even leave comments. And after the message, after this message from our sponsors, if you will, let's dive into Acts chapter 6. But I do think it's a, it's a great blessing. I mean, I know I've kind of, um, you know, been petting Brother Dave's ego a little bit back there, but he's done a great job. I don't know. I just, I went back and reviewed a few minutes of the videos from the last couple of weeks, and they get better and better. Um, he's able to put scripture up if, if I tell him ahead of time what my, core, my key verse is. And um, it's actually right, it'd be right up here on the screen. I know I'm being silly, but that's what those people on YouTube are. They're always pointing somewhere. Um, so I think it's a great thing, um, and so I think it's a great way to get the gospel and the message out even beyond our normal boundaries. I mean, we can reach people anywhere in the world, really, uh, and that's pretty neat. So um, anyway, enough of that. And so we've read all the way through Acts chapter 6 already, and so like we've been doing lately, we'll just kind of study it verse by verse here together. <clears throat> in verse 1, it says, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. <clears throat> and like I said, this should come as no surprise to you. It almost seems like a refresher because we talked a little bit about this before. But we understand from, and we see in Scripture, and I like to bring this out, we see in Scripture this concept of multiplication. Um, you know, that's something Caitlin's in the process of learning right now, our multiplication tables. And they do things a little differently than, I, than we did when I was in school. But, but she's learning the, her multiplication tables. But God, is a, he's in the business of multiplying. And it says, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied. And so, all through Scripture you see this doctrine of multiplication. You, if you will give, think about this, if you will give God a little, or even if you give God a lot... He can take that and he'll multiply it. And so if you give him a little, he'll multiply a little. If you give him a lot, he'll multiply and make it even, you know, exponentially that much more. You think about from the feeding of the 5,000 with a little lad's lunch. I mean, five little barley loaves, little cakes, barley cakes, and two small fish. Jesus blessed it and break it and gave it out to the disciples and for the apostles to disperse. And they fed 5,000. And, and then they had enough remnants left over. They had filled up 12 baskets full because God is in the work of multiplying. You know, it's an amazing thing if you think about it. Think about all the, the parables that Jesus taught about multiplying. You know, he, he, in the, he rebuked the one who, you know, his, of his owner knew of him that he was a hard man and he dealt business in places and dabbled in things that were, you know, maybe out of his realm. And, but he said he feared that, and so he hid the master's money, and he didn't even invest it, and, and the master was not pleased with that. God wants us to give him what we have and let him multiply it. And that works with our finances. It works in our daily life with our time, with our talents. Give what you have to God, whether it's a little or whether it's a lot, and God will multiply it. And so 
Even here to the early church in Acts, we see all throughout Scripture. And you may say, well, I only have a little to give, and, and that's okay because God's the one who multiplies it. Just entrust it to God and see what marvelous things He can do. You know, I'm reminded when I think of the work of salvation, and I see multiplication there, but I also see the process in which God does that. If you'll turn with me for just a minute, I'm going to mark my spot too. Turn over to 1 Corinthians for just a moment. It won't take you long to get there. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. So 1 Corinthians 3, 8. I'm sorry, 6. We'll start with 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. It says this. It says, I have planted, this is Paul, you know, with his letter to the churches of Corinth. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. You know, there's this, there's this process. And this, listen, know of a certainty, if you'll plant and you'll water those seeds of the gospel, God will give an increase. You know, we can get a little bit discouraged sometimes. You know, um, people, you know, we don't know necessarily in a service, all the people who could be lost, you know, it could be some lost people in the service. And, you know, sometimes I wonder, you know, when I share the gospel and I share it clearly and I give an invitation, I wonder, did that, did that affect anybody? Did that make a difference? But here's the thing. As Christians, we have to remind ourselves we're in the job of planting seeds and we're in the job of watering seeds, but it's God who has to give the increase. Now, I'm not using that as an excuse, now, but that's true even in 101 evangelism. I can go up to somebody and say, hey, are you sure you're going to go to heaven when you die? And I can, go, I can spend 20 minutes with them. But guess what? I may not get them to the point where they'll, but they're willing to say, yes, I'm ready to pray and receive Jesus as my Savior. And guess what? If, if you can't get them to that point, you try, that's okay. You planted a seed. And you know what will happen? God willing, and I believe God will do this, somebody else will come along. Maybe a year later. It could be a day later. Who knows? They're going to water that seed. And somebody else will come by and water it again. And you know what? Eventually, God will give the increase. And that's, that's important for us to know that we, that we don't get discouraged along the way in the, in the preaching of the gospel and even service to God. God will give the increase. We plant, listen what we do, we plant with Scripture and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we cultivate the seed in prayer, and we water with our tears. You ever thought about that? You know, um, I, I love the verse. You've heard me say it several times since I've been here in the, these six-plus months now. Psalm 126.6 says, He that goeth forth with, and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You know, we need to have a burden for lost people. The only way God's going to ever bless Stanfield Baptist Church is if we have a burden for lost people. We can do all kinds of things. We can have programs and we can have big events and we can have all this stuff. But if we don't stay with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that's not the paramount and number one focus of this church, we can't expect to be blessed. While God, listen, while God multiplying the church is a marvelous and it's a wonderful thing, the problem that we run into is sometimes it comes along with the thing that's mentioned next. So if you turn back there to Acts chapter 6, it says in that same verse 1, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring. And I, I'm just saying this as a, a warning. It never hurts for me to throw this out there every once in a while, but while God is multiplying the early church here, and while that is marvelous and it's wonderful, and this is common, it comes about a lot, along the next verse here, that same verse, it mentions murmuring, murmuring. You know, if you recall back when we studied the story of Abraham, and we're not through with Abraham yet, we're, we're getting there, but we need to go back to Abraham and finish that study up. But when we studied the life of Abraham, do you remember there arose strife between the herdsmen of Abram and the herdsmen of Lot? 
there was contention, there was strife. And, and here, and that's an oftentimes a thing that happens when people are multiplied. And that's what really happened, if you want to know the truth. I mean, there was, wasn't enough room for Lot's people and his herdsmen and his cattle and for Abram's to all coexist. So they had to kind of give themselves some space, if you will. And I simply say that as just a cautionary statement to know that as God blesses and we grow and we multiply and we increase, you know, there's a risk of murmuring to come in, but let it not be said of us. Let us not let that be named among us. You know, I suppose, um, and I guess I better, I better say this in some of my notes, and, you know, I, I'm not necessarily a preacher that has a, a poem and a, and a joke every single time I preach, but um, I'm just going to read it like it is in my notes because if I don't, I'll, for, I'll, be, I'll be sad I didn't get my joke in there. But if you recall, as we studied the life of Abraham, there arose strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle, or I suppose they could have been herd women. So there's my joke. You know, that's, that's just, man, that's bad, isn't it? But if you know the culture right now and what people are doing when, in all this, you know, I guess it's just, um, they might not have been herdsmen, they might have been herd women. So sorry, with the current events, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> anyway, that's a bad joke. Boo. So glad there's not like a, a boo track or whatever, like a laugh track. Brother Dave doesn't have that yet, a laugh track and, a, um, and all that. So the Grecian... <laughs> So as we continue here and finish out verse 1, the Grecian, or they're also known as the Hellenistic Jews, were Jews, but they were of the Greek culture, they were of the Greek ideas, the Greek language. They spoke Greek, and typically they read the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. They were commonly scattered around Greece and other parts round about, but as they had come to Jerusalem for the feast, you know, like we, we read about in Acts chapter 1 Acts chapter 2, when all the people were gathered there, all the Jews had come there. And they, they now had believed on Jesus, and so they decided to continue there. They decided to stay in Jerusalem. And so they had a legitimate concern, but, but let us be weary of murmuring, and especially as God adds to the church. Let us be very careful and cautious of that. And so that finishes out verse 1. So you know the, the story and what's happening here. Now in verse 2... They brought all the believers together to discuss the matter. And I think that's, that's important. Um, it says, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we, whom we may appoint over this business. See, they called, the twelve called the multitude together. They were not going to, um, you know, they were going to pick people, I guess the way, best way to put it is, from among their own group. And I think that that's a good thing to do. Um, you know, when we're, I think it's a little bit, I don't know, I have a little bit of apprehension about it sometimes. A lot of churches today, every time there's a new opening, they're just really quick to be looking outside their four walls when they may have somebody right here in the church that loves the church and they've grown up in this church, and they've, you've seen them, and you, you know their testimony that may be somebody who could do something in the church. And that could be anything, right? I mean, it could be in any possible place you could think to serve, and I think it's to our detriment sometimes when we're quick to try to look outside and, you know, put applications out. I'm not necessarily talking about pastor, you might, but I'm just, and even that might be true, you know, down, you know, at some point in some churches, there may be men in certain churches that would be good to grow up into that position. And so he calls these believers that are already part of the early church, this multitude together, and they, the apostles talk to them about this. And they, they brought them all there to discuss the matter, and they knew, here's what the apostles knew. They knew the weightier matters should not be neglected and those weightier matters were that of prayer and the ministry of the word, as they say later on in verse 4. See, they in God's wisdom and through the Holy Spirit, they may very well have thought back on the days of Moses. And I alluded to this when we talked about um, the qualifications of a deacon, so we're not going to spend any time there. And you can refer back in your memory banks to my sermon on that um, for a deeper dive into the events in the days of Moses. But the little quick one sentence is, Jethro instructed Moses to raise up men to help in the judgment of Israel 
<clears throat> and here, too, there was a great need for delegation. Any good leader learns to delegate in order not to lose focus on the mission at hand. You know, that's something that I'm thankful when I came here to Stanford, and there's already these different groups and things that are, you know, committees and such, because truth be told, that helps me as a pastor to keep my focus on the, the, the weightier matters, the things that, and I'm not saying those things aren't important, but the, the, the word of God and, and proclaiming the gospel and those kind of things, which are of the utmost importance. And so that's something that any good leader understands is delegation. And listen, that is not belittling what these men the, that would later be called deacons, or that's not belittling what they were called to do in serving tables. It was an important ministry of, of the charity of the widows that were widows indeed. I mean, this is something that's important uh, without a doubt. And then we move on to the qualifications. And, and we've, like I said, studied this not too long ago. But it says, Look ye out in verse 3, Among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. They have an honest report. They're Holy Spirit filled. They're wise. These were not to be novices, but to be experienced men. Ones that knew the word of God, they, could, they, were, they were wise in the word of God, and, and they could make godly decisions in matters, and were led by the Holy Ghost. See, they, these guys were going to go out on their own, with very little or no supervision. You know, if you look at Stephen, you look, at, um, you look later at Philip, you know, it wasn't like Philip had to run back to Jerusalem every 10 seconds and tell him what he was up to. They were sent out to do these things, and God led them to it. And, and I think that that's important to know that these need to be people who can be trusted and entrusted with the work of the Lord. They had a good report from outside, and that's important as well as to not bring a reproach to the work of God. And so that's pretty simple. Like I said, we don't have to spend time there because we've already hashed through that. But now let's look at verse 4. It says, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. It can't be emphasized enough the importance of prayer, of meditation and ministry of the word. And that is to be performed, as it says here, continually. We cannot, for we, if we cannot live um, but days, and think about this, this is so true. If we can't live but days without water and maybe weeks without food, how can we live, how can we grow spiritually without continually feasting on the Word of God? If we're not continually feasting on God's Word, if we're not continually spending time in prayer, how can we expect to be healthy Christians? I would say we cannot. And that's a, that's a serious issue we have today. You know, the Bible says, Take no thought of what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or wherewithal you should be clothed, for your heavenly Father knows you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We're so worried about what we're going to... Some of you might be worrying about it right now. What am I going to have for supper? You're sitting there and you're hungry. But I'm here to tell you, God will take care of that. And we're very careful to make sure we don't miss a meal physically. But you know what we do over and over again? We miss meals spiritually. And that's not just talking about when we come, to, we come together in church and we hear the preaching of the Word, but it's talking about your time along with God, your time to meditate on the Word, your time to pray. We're, we need to be continually feasting on the Word of God if we're going to be healthy, mature Christians. You know, we start off, it's just milk to us, but as we grow and we mature, it becomes meat. Now, if you look at verse 5 there, and it says, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen. Now, the men were chosen from among them, and I said this already, so I'll go through it quickly, but these were men they knew and men they could trust. We must be careful as a church as we grow to allow a man, even if aged, to serve, us, to serve along with us and before us before they are to be entrusted with the work and the ministries of the church. And the good news is, y'all have all been here longer than I have. And so I guess what that means is I'm the one you need to keep an eye on because you know what all you believe for the most part. But maybe you, I'm just, I'm just kind of being silly. I think you know everything I believe and every little bit about it. I try to be very transparent if you haven't figured that out. But I want to just give some, um, you know, some gratitude to Brother Doug because you have no idea how hard that was for him week after week after week after week 
to make sure that the men who came and filled this pulpit were men that would preach the word of God and be true. And, and I mean, it was not easy. And because people are not honest, are they, Brother Doug? They're not transparent. And you know what? That's, that's a serious thing, and we need to be careful with that. Um, here's the thing. What was special about Stephen? Well, Stephen is first mentioned as this, a man full of faith. Now, you think about what the first words are when you think of somebody. That's a really good, that would be a good epitaph to have on your tombstone, a man full of faith. That's what Stephen was. He was, a, he was a man full of faith. And you know the word of God. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please him, for we must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We, you know, the Bible says, uh, it talks a lot about faith, and, you know, the just shall live by faith, and we're to walk by faith and not by sight, and on and on and on. But listen, faith is paramount in our walk and our service to God. The only reason any of us are here is because of faith. We believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and we have faith in God that he's going to see us through things and walk through this world and life with us. You know, Brother Eddie, I've reminded you again what he reminded me of years ago. Don't undo by reason a step you make by faith. You know, there's a lot of faith steps you might have to take. You know, I don't know what, you know, stirring around in y'all's heart, rattling around in y'all's brains about ideas that you have. Hey, guess what? You know, we're off to a new start, new pastor. And I'm sure some of you have ideas. Come talk to me. I mean, if, if God's laid on your heart an idea, and some of you shared things with me, but you know what? Let's, let's get those things out there and let's do what we can for God. Because we want to we be people who do things by faith. Even if you don't think it makes rational sense, come and talk to me about it anyway, because it may be something that we need to take a leap of faith, a step of faith. If you look in verse 6, you know, these were the ones, it says they, so here's what they did is they laid their hands on them and they prayed. They prayed, they sought God's approval, they sought God's will, they sought, God, they sought God's peace. They laid hands on them, which is much the same way the presbytery laid hands on young Timothy to send him along in the work of the Lord, not unlike what we did at my ordination service here a few weeks ago. And, if, and I just wanted to bring this out because some of you may know or may not know, but if you're wondering why we didn't do that with Brother Don when he was elected recently as our second deacon, well, it's simply put because he has already been ordained as a deacon. Back years ago, when they were members over at Barrow Baptist Church, he was ordained as a deacon there. So we didn't have to lay our hands on him and, and to have an ordination service for Brother Don because that's already been done years ago in his case. And then in verse 7, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. See, this is the progression. First, the word of God increased. Stick with the order of Scripture. What does the Bible say? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Then with the power of God's word going out, the number saved continued to multiply greatly. That's the thing. As long as we get the word out, God will multiply. As long as excuse me, we keep preaching the good news of the gospel, God will do his part and it will it'll multiply. That, that's the order of things. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We don't need to focus on flashy programs to draw people in. We need to draw them in by the preaching of the word and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, even the religious bunch, many of them were persuaded. You know how they were persuaded? They saw that these guys were unlearned and ignorant men, but they expounded the word of God with great wisdom and with great power and with great boldness. And they took note of them that they had been with Jesus. And, and it says there in verse 7, at the very last part, and a great company of the priest were obedient to the faith. I mean, don't discount anybody. We want to count people out sometimes. You know, we say, well, you know, they're, that family member, they're, they're a part of that group. And I don't think I'll ever reach them. Or, you know, that, that friend of mine, you know, they're out there and they, they got a different religion altogether. But you know what? Don't discount them. These guys were the staunchly religious, pious ones that Jesus rebuked over and again. And guess what? Many of these guys believed on Jesus. 
And they were obedient under the faith. Don't count anybody out. And that's so important for us. Stephen, in verse 8, was full of faith and power. He did great wonders. You know, God gave the apostles many of the first and many of the first disciples special gifts to perform wonders and miracles. And we'll, I mentioned we're going to discuss that at a later time in a whole other message, a special message just about that. But, you know, the sign gifts, the gifts of tongues and of special wonders and special healings, the, the Bible says that those are now ceased, but although there are many that would argue against that today. And, and there again, I always had to preface that by saying, or not preface it, I guess I'm putting on the tail end of it, but this listen, that doesn't mean God's not in the miracle working business. He still works miracles day after day after day. He just doesn't do it in the same way he did it at the early church. We have a completed revelation of God's word. You know, if God, as, as has been said, if God would sit across the table from us and say something, he wouldn't say anything different than what he's already said to us in his word. Now, if you look there at verse 9, it says these people that, that Peter, I'm sorry, not Peter, Stephen, is, is kind of getting their feathers ruffled, if you will. These were certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines. And it goes on to name some of these other people in these other synagogues. But listen, the Libertines were of Rome. They were of Rome. They were foreigners, which had been nationalized or being slaves from birth were now freemen. And Paul may have been of this synagogue with these libertines, or it may be more likely he was of this, the synagogue of Cilicia, as he was from Tarsus, which is a city of Cilicia. And you say, why are you bringing that up? Because you remember the story we find out later, that is, we find out in the rest of the story next week, when they stoned Stephen, what was it? There was a young man that stood there and hold, held the coats of the men as they stoned Stephen, and that was Paul. And so it is very likely that, there's, that Paul is already very aware of what's happening here because he's of one of these synagogues here mentioned in verse 9, very likely. And so they surely thought they were defending their religion and they're disputing with Stephen as Paul, we know, had great zeal as a Pharisee of the Pharisees of the tribe of Benjamin and all those things that he was. And then in verse 10... This is the key, though. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. See, God's wisdom puts to naught the wisdom of the world. God's word, although often maligned, often rejected, cannot be truly refuted because it is the true word of the very living God, perfectly preserved without error. And I kind of said that different than my notes, but I want to say it again. You know why they couldn't say anything against what Stephen was saying? It's because, listen, folks, we do have before us an inerrant word of God, the true living God. God breathed, verbally inspired, without error. And because of that, it's true and it is the truth and it's perfectly preserved. And so we can be just like with it was here with Stephen they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. I'll tell you what, you won't go wrong with this book. If you try to talk to somebody and reason with them and you try to keep this out of it, because a lot of people try to do that. You know, there's been a big movement that started years ago, you know, because we know there's been the whole creation and evolution debate for a long time. Well, you know, there's been this thing that's crept in and they're trying to say, well, Let's talk about it, but let's leave the God part out. And then they'll just talk about things like, well, but you know, look how complex things are. You know, they just try to reason with people based on science alone. Doesn't work, folks. What we need to do is we need to keep the Word of God in there. That's important to do. It's not just about the science, if you can prove or disprove, because it's hard to do any of that, honestly. But what we need to stick with is, thus saith the Lord. What does the word of God say? That's what we need to stick with. If you look there in verse 11, they suborn men 
which basically what it means there is they bribed men to lie against Stephen, to say that he had spoke blasphemies against Moses and against God. And listen, I fear that most of our elected officials may very well be suborned, or I always don't ever pronounce that right, but bribed, if you will, paid off by special interest groups. I don't care which side of the aisle they're on, selling out their constituents for filthy lucre's sake. And don't be surprised when men lie and say all manner of evil against you. Because that's what they did to all the people of the early church. What did they do? They kept, they kept maligning them and kept lying about them because they had ulterior motives. And folks, I'm here today. Don't be surprised when people lie about us as Christians. Maybe even try to malign your character or say all manner of evil against you folks. For if they did as much or did more even though to our Lord Jesus, how do we expect to fare better? I mean, that's what that's, that's every time he went somewhere, he found the resistance crowd, right? The ones that were spreading lies about him and saying or trying to trip him up on his words and try to catch him in something, right? It would happen everywhere he went. And so these men were bribed to lie against Stephen, to say these things against him. And, you know, they had to do that because that's all they could do. That's, that's all they could do. I mean, it's kind of like when Jesus was raised from the dead. All they could do but was to make up a lie that his, his disciples came and stole him away in the night. Because you know what? They couldn't do anything against God's work and God's power. All they could do was bribe some people, lie about some things. That's all they could do. If you look in verses 12 through 14, we're almost done. They stirred up the people. This, these groups of the synagogues here, of the Libertines and Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and all these groups, they stirred up the people, they stirred up the elders and the scribes, and listen, here's what they did in verse 12. They came upon him, and they caught him, and they brought him to the council. And they set up, look what they did in verse 13, false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. You know what? The enemy knows how to stir up strife. He's really good at that. The enemy knows how to stir up strife. He specializes, he specializes in lies and deceit. He's the father of lies, folks. And, and, in the, this, and, and listen, and oftentimes he specializes in lies and deceit. deceit. He stirs up strife and, he, and it comes along with this mob mentality. I think we see a lot of that today, don't we? With this mob mentality. Listen, folks, let us be free thinkers. Let us not be sheeple. You've probably heard that term. Don't need to explain it. I think you know what that means. That you, don't, you can't think for yourself. You're just following blindly. P folks, don't be sheeple. Being led off the cliff by the media or being led off the cliff by whatever it is that you're following, let us be wise in godly wisdom and let us see things for what they truly are. Let us critique everything through the lenses of Scripture to know what is true and what is false. Everything today, you don't know what's true and what's false. But I can tell you one thing, I know there is an absolute truth. I, I might not know and you don't know what's true and what's false anymore. It's just a blur. I mean, it is just... It's kind of scary how bad it is. that you just There's no way you could know if it's true or, or false or right or wrong. But when it comes to things, I can know for sure. If it's in this book, it's true and it's right. So we can cling to that for sure. So let us critique everything through the lenses of Scripture to know what is true and what is false. They, like their father the devil, they twist the truth and they twist God's word and and, and not, under, not understanding of what Jesus spoke or, or even of what he taught as touching the law. They did the same thing to Jesus as they're doing here to Stephen. You know, accusing him of blaspheming, you know, and, and, and all these kind of things that they accused him of. It was an awful thing, but they're accusing Stephen here of blasphemous words against this holy place and against the law. And, and that's a dangerous place to be, folks. I mean goes without saying that these folks, they didn't really know what they were doing. In fact, we're going to find out later, what did Stephen say? He, he just almost verbatim, like Jesus, as he hung on the cross, what did Jesus say? 
Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As Jesus, as, I'm sorry, as Stephen was being stoned to death, guess what he said? Forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. You know what? These people don't know what they're doing. They're just, it's the blind leading the blind. And what do we find out? When the blind lead the blind, they both fall in the pit. They both fall in the ditch. They're both in bad shape. Verse 15, as we're getting ready to stop this, conclude the message this evening. Here's the thing about Stephen. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it has been the face of an angel. You know, God's spirit was upon him and it affected his very countenance. Even his look that, that was about him. His face was as that of an angel. Can you imagine? Of a truth, if you will be filled with the spirit of God, it will affect your countenance. And people will take notice. You may not be shining like an angel, but if you're Holy Spirit filled and you're in love with your Lord and you're serving Him, and you know what? It'll show in your face. It'll show in your life. And folks will take notice of that. If you'll be filled with God's Spirit, it will affect your countenance and people will take notice. Amen. You know... It would have been easy for Stephen at any point during all this. You know, I don't know if you've noticed that, but you don't see one jot or tittle about Stephen trying to defend himself, do you? You know, we spend a lot of time trying to defend ourselves, don't we? And, we, and you know what? Sometimes I think what we need to do is just give them the Word of God, and that's good enough. You know? And so that's it. Take this with you this week. Be like a Stephen, that you would be filled with God's Spirit, that people would take notice, that you can make a difference, and you can make a stand for and stand on the faith of the Word of God. So I'm going to leave you tonight with a cliffhanger. We'll see the rest of the story of Stephen next week in Acts chapter 7. So let us dismiss in a word of prayer. You can all stand to your feet. We're not going to have an invitation time tonight. We had a good invitation this morning. We'll have a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Let's see. I'll ask Brother...